space this morning. If you would join me in our opening hymn, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart, 499. Amen. Will you lift your voices this morning and sing, uh, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart?
and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exalt you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient among all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. Yes. In everything give thanks, yes. for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not for thought, prophesize, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Amen. Amen. Our hymn will be number 508, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Yeah, I know you're in the bottom. 
bless them. We help them, Father, we ask you to bring us along and teach us what thus said the Lord. And then, Lord, we ask blessings upon the leaders of this country. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just pray that they do the right things in your name. Dear Lord, we ask blessings upon the Saint Louis Baptist Church in its entirety. Bless our past and all its members. Yes, God. Bless us and shed hands everywhere. Dear Lord, touch our heart and we thank you, Father, for our salvation. Yes, yes. Give us a plan that only you can work out. Yes. Well, Heavenly Father, we just thank you. And bless her. Keep us close to thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Running through our veins. And then, Master, 
brand new day. Master, we thank you for eyes to see, nose to smell, mouth to talk, ears to hear, legs to walk, arms to wave. But Father God, we know it's not for us, it's for your glory. But Master, most of all, we thank you for your daughter, son, Jesus.
pray his strength because he, like myself, uh, was in Dallas on uh, this past week to share with your pastor. And I want to do this before I go any further. Thank those members that went down to share with your pastor. I'm sure he'll thank you again, but that says a lot about you and a lot about this place where God has placed him. Uh, that the people that he shepherds uh, know you can't take him out of the hurt and the bereavement, but you can share it with him. Amen? Amen. Uh, so as I yield, and I can say like John, I must decrease so that he can increase. And after the music ministry blesses us with the A selection, uh, the next speaking voice you hear from behind this pulpit is the none other Reverend Darrell Fielder Jr. of the Greater Mount Olive Baptist Church of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. God bless you.
Sometimes in life. Sometimes in life. I need your prayers. A few weeks ago, I was on the phone with my friend and brother, Pastor Brandon Walker. We were just talking and laughing about random stuff as we often do. Then the conversation kind of took a turn as I began to share uh, some serious matters that were on my heart. And after I finished sharing those things, uh, Pastor Walker responded with the words, sometimes in life. Yes, and he didn't say anything else. <laughs> I sat, I waited for him to finish his thought. I, I just knew for sure he had something else to say after I had poured out my heart. I sat and waited for him to finish his thought. And after a few seconds of me waiting, he then said, that's it, sometimes in life. We initially laughed about it, but a couple hours later, after I had sat with that thought and I spoke to him again, I shared with him that that phrase wouldn't leave me alone. Because how often do we share issues with others and when we're done, they start to give us advice and at the end of their advice, we're just as stuck then as we were when they started talking. Come on. Now don't get me wrong, they meant well and they seriously desired to help you to sort through those things and to figure uh, those things out. But perhaps they just didn't have the right answer. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps they didn't fully understand what it was you were sharing with them. Or perhaps, which is most often the case, you didn't even fully understand what you were dealing with and you couldn't properly articulate the issue so that they could understand as well. And we leave those conversations, we leave those moments with our friends with more questions than answers. We leave that conversation perhaps in a worse mental state than when we started. Because the truth of the matter is, child of God, is there will be times in life that you will go through things and simply just not understand. You will go through things that those that love you most and best just don't understand. You will go through things in life 
that will leave you with more questions and answers. We often find ourselves in these spaces of suffering and misunderstanding, and we often run to the scriptures for help. That's a great thing to do for any baptized believer in Jesus Christ because we know uh, that the Bible is full of wisdom. It's full of knowledge. It's full of God's direction. We run to the Bible. We look to these scriptures to give us a guide as to what to say to God about our plight or, in, or what God has to say about our plight. A fourth century church father by the name of Saint uh, Anathus famously said that most of scripture speaks to us. But the Psalms speak for us. Yes, and this is what makes the book of Psalms unique because for the most part, the words of them are directed toward God. They speak for us. Like that is why for centuries, the Psalms have been the prayer book of the faithful seeking intimacy with God. You don't know what to say to God? Look to the Psalm. You don't know what to make of what you're dealing with? Look to the psalm. You've got more questions than answers. Look to the psalm. We look to the psalm because they are a good place to land. Yes, sir. Can I tell you why? Because most of the psalms contained in this collection have a pattern known as orientation, disorientation, and then reorientation. Wow. They follow this pattern of orientation, disorientation, and then reorientation. That is... The prayer is spoken by the author of this song begins with a sense of orientation. They usually open with the acknowledging of who God is. They most often open up with just simply acknowledging God. It is followed by declaring a sense of disorientation and either a plea for help or a cry for help. And then it ends with a sense of reorientation, some hopeful statement declaring confidence in God's faithfulness, God's love, or some kind of exclamation of praise. And this happens whether or not the cause of the disorientation is gone or not. For example, and it was preached so well on last week, Pastor Brandon Walker opened up Psalm 23. This psalm opened by acknowledging God as shepherd, and then you trickle down to verse 4, you find yourself in a dark valley, but you can shout even in that valley because you're not alone. Orientation, disorientation, reorientation. And the, I, I dare not insult your intelligence or try to unpack what my friend and brother preached on last week, but that psalm is a good example for often how life is. You, you wake up and everything seems to be going right, and then halfway through the day, it seems like all hell breaks loose in your life, and you're confused, you're frustrated, you don't know what to do, or where to turn, or where to go, or who to talk to, and then all of a sudden, somehow God does something, or sends somebody your way, and then you feel like, okay, I'm secure, I'm reoriented. That seems to be how life goes. Yeah. And for the most part, the Psalms follow this pattern. Yeah. However, Psalm 88, Psalm I lifted for the preaching moment this morning, is an exception. This is possibly one of the most difficult of the Psalms. And arguably, it's the darkest of the Psalms. This Psalm begins with orientation. And then it continues and ends with disorientation. Yeah. Unlike the other Psalms that offer some type of solution, some form of hope at the end, this psalm ends in disorientation. Yeah. And if we're honest with one another this morning, we've all been there. Yes, yeah. Acknowledging God and all that we do. Some of us can testify we wake up in the morning and say our prayers and do our devotion. We're going to have a great yes, day. Sir. But somehow the enemy creeps in on yeah. Somehow something goes wrong. The, the dog gets sick. Cat don't want to act right. Kids get out of hand. The people on that job are giving you, uh, making you want to lay your religion down, as my grandmother used to say. It. And it seems like by the nighttime, it's still disorientation. There's no good news. You come home and you turn on the news and you see what's going on in our world. Disorientation. You get a phone call that a family member has gone on to be with the Lord. Disorientation. 
God orientation. And I know you're wondering why on earth would the preacher pick this song? Why would God send this preacher to preach a song like this in a time like this? I'm glad you asked. I'm preaching this because the reality of life is that it won't always turn out the way you desire. Amen. You won't always get good news at the end. Sometimes you must live with not understanding what's going on. Yes, sir. Life just has a way of dealing you blows that you don't understand. We don't understand why we're in this pandemic that could have been over in a couple months, 16 months later, we're still in it. Yes, we don't understand. We don't understand why God still allows a government elected by the people to mistreat the very people that elected them. We just don't understand. We don't understand why that in 2021, racism is still raging in the land. We just don't understand. We don't understand why black folk are being hunted and killed in the streets like wild animals with little to no consequences. We just don't understand. And before you sit here with your holy hat on, not in saying this won't happen to you, even those of us who serve the Lord will sometimes face things that we just don't understand. If you don't want to say amen, the psalmist here is Herman the Ezrite. I know that doesn't mean much to you because perhaps like me, you haven't heard this name often in church. But consider this. According to 1 Chronicles, Herman was appointed by David to lead the congregation of Israel in praise and worship. So Herman, in a sense, was an ancient Israel worship leader. He was serving in church, being a family man giving of his time and talent to the Lord, and he still faced trouble. Yes, I know those of you who have been saved since you were born and you've been in church, but you will face troubling times you just don't understand. You won't understand why you serve in church well, pay your tithes, live according to the covenant, sing in the choir, usher at the door, and still church folk drag your name in the streets. You just don't understand. You won't understand. Why you do everything you know to do right and still find yourself in a space where everything seems wrong. You just don't understand. You won't understand how you eat healthy and exercise on a regular basis and still get a doctor's, a bad doctor's report. You just won't understand. You won't understand why you made the grades, got the degree, and still didn't get the dream job. You just won't understand. You won't understand why you love them with all your heart, body, mind, and soul, and they still cheat on you. You just don't understand. You won't understand why you provide a place for them to live, eat, and be clothed, and those children grow up and just disrespect you. Sometimes life will deal you a hand that you just won't understand. I wish I had some witnesses in here this morning that could testify, oh, I look good this morning and my Sunday go to meeting clothes, but there are some days, matter of fact, it could be two days that you are dealing with some stuff you just don't understand. Why, Lord, am I dealing with this? Why, Lord, do I keep having to go through that? Why, Lord, does bad news seem to find my address? Why, Lord, am I going through this? And I just don't understand. So what does this psalm say about those times when you don't understand? I got three quick points, and I'll be out the way, and I'm going to find me some chicken. But sometimes in life, you will face desperate afflictions. Desperate afflictions. The psalmist in verses 3 through 8 outlines a few things that he's facing. He says his soul is full of trouble. His life is drawing near the grave. He's a man that has no strength. Like the dead man who the Lord doesn't remember and are cut off from his hand. He said he feels the Lord has laid him in the lowest pit, in the darkness, in the deeps. He says he feels like the Lord has laid his wrath on him and he is afflicted with all of his ways. What a list of troubles. What great affliction. What exceeding sorrow. And if I had time, I would stand here and explain each and every one of those afflictions. I would seek to explain these metaphors and what they symbolize. I would give you the etymology or the original language of these words. I would go through the syntax or the structure of the sentences in the stanza. I would try to impress you with my intellectual acumen and try to prove that that seminary training actually taught me something. But in my study and in my preparation, I realized that like the psalmist, there will come a time when none of that really matters. Why do you say that, preacher? 
Are you suggesting that words in the Bible don't matter? No, sir, no, ma'am. But what I am suggesting yeah, no, is that life can get so bad for the believer Come on now. that everything that could go wrong, not will go wrong, but is wrong. Yeah. And you don't want to hear no flowery language, and you don't want to hear no big words, and you don't want to hear the Greek and Hebrew and Latin root of a word. You don't want to hear the these and thous. And the psalmist soul is so burdened, he's near the grave. He feels like God has laid him in the darkest pits. All of that makes him feel like God doesn't remember him. Have you ever been there? Oh, man. Have you ever been there where you come to church and the preacher stands before you and you can't connect with what he's saying because what's troubling you is so bad that you don't feel like God is even speaking to you? Oh. You don't want to hear how smart I am. You don't want to hear uh, 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 if I can pronounce the big words. You just want to know, God, where are you? Yes, God. I mean, you're in pain and no physician or medicine can help. You're feeling weak and you can't find strength. Feeling alone and no one to call on. Not only have you thought about that, but it seems like death is stalking you. I ask again, have you been there? Oh, yeah. I know I can't be the only one here that's been there. I wonder if I got about seven witnesses and I'll make eight that can testify. You woken up to struggles. You go to bed to struggles. You dream about struggles. Everywhere you look is a struggle. Everywhere you turn a struggle. Every Conversation of struggle. It's something. Your family tripping, friends switching up, boss and co workers working your last Christian nerve. And if you add that all up, it will make you feel like you're dying. Functioning but not feeling. And this song puts an end to that flawed and fickle theology that suggests that if you're saved, you won't have struggles. I know, you know, we live in this decree and declare time and that say what you want and God is obligated to do it. Uh, name it and claim it. Uh, you named it and it ain't showed up yet. Oh, call it and haul it. You made the call and it seemed like the line is busy. Oh, Spin around three times and God is going to make a way. You done spent yourself dizzy and you still stuck. Because sometimes in life, your education won't exempt you from struggle. Yes, sir. Your bank account can't buy you out of struggle. Yes, your family can't love you out of struggle. Your network can't recommend you out of struggle. And even your pastor can't preach you out of trouble. Your choir can't sing you out of trouble. The musicians can't play you out of trouble. The deacons can't pray you out of trouble. Sometimes in life you got to struggle. But I brought some Bible to back me up if y'all don't believe me. Job 14 and 1 says, a man born of a woman is of a few days and those days are full of trouble. And I know that preacher stood up and told you it's going to get better. But let me bust your bubble and put a hole in your halo and let you know that it might get worse before it gets better. Yes, sir. Okay, you don't believe me. Look at verse 6 and verse 7 of this song. The psalmist says in verse 6, you have put me in a pit. Yes, Come on now. Verse 7 says, your wrath is heavy upon me. You overwhelm me with all your ways. Lean in, child of God. What if I told you that the reason why you don't understand this struggle is because it's God-given? <laughs> what if I told you that this situation you're in is not satanic strategy? But it's a sovereign suggestion. What if I told you that God put you here? What do you do when the God that heals is the reason you're set up? What do you do when the God that provides cuts off your supply? What do you do when the God that makes a way gets in the way? What do you do when the God that opens doors is closing and locking doors? What do you do when God that leads you leaves you? Sometimes in life, you just won't understand. And it, and it don't take a seminary degree or a bunch of education to understand that sometimes you don't want to hear all of that. You don't want to hear what the preacher got to say. You don't want to hear no hooping. You don't want to hear no singing. All you're wondering is, God, why? God, why am I going through this? So those desperate afflictions will lead to number two, some despondent appeals. Yes, sir. Despondent appeals. Despondent, by way of definition, means a feeling of or showing profound helplessness, yes, sir. dejection, discouragement, or gloom. 
We know that these questions the psalmist asks are from a place of hopelessness because verse 9 lets us know in a very articulate and elaborate way that the psalmist is holding his hands out and crying. The text puts it this way. My eye mourneth by reason of affliction. I have called daily upon you. I have stretched my hands to thee. The psalmist is crying, begging, pleading for God to answer him in his affliction. If we were to put it in modern day time, this psalmist is singing, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If I will draw thyself from me, oh, whether shall I go? The psalmist is suffering a great deal. And the next few verses, he raises some, some questions for God. Look at the questions in verses 10 through 14. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up and praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave? Are your wonders known in the darkness? Or your righteousness in the land of the forgotten? And he tops it off by asking, why do you cast my soul away? And I wish I, you know, I, wish I had time to break it all down and, and, and make you uh, feel like I know what I'm talking about. But let me sum it up this way. The psalmist with tears in his eyes, with his hands out in the darkness, simply asks, are you here? Uh, God, I'm weak. God, I'm struggling. God, I'm near death. Where are you? The God that said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, seems absent. The God that says, Lord, I'll be with you to the end of the world, is nowhere to be found. Have you been there? Doing all you know to do right then, the God that places you somewhere, leads you somewhere? You prayed for that house and God gave it to you, and then you see the struggle to pay the mortgage? (laughs) It'll make you ask, God, are you here? Yes, sir. You pray for that spouse, and before the reception cake is gone, y'all fussing and fighting. It'll make you mad. God, are you here? You pray for that car, and it seems like every day a new light shows up on the dashboard. It'll make you mad. God, are you here? You got more month than money. You'll ask God, are you here? And I can't be the only one here that has had to sit and sit in the gloom that you're in, and it's caused you to have some questions. For God. Yes, sir. God, why? Yes, sir. God, how? God, when? Yes, God, where? God, who? Mm-hmm. Feeling like God has isolated you, yes, and to add insult to injury, He leaves. Uh, and you have to ask God, where are you? I know you hear me. I know you see me. <laughs> but God, I can't see or hear you. God, where are you? I know this has been the cry of many of us over the last 15, 16 months. We're still in this pandemic. And we're asking God, where are you? It was seen by now that God would send some prophet to say it's going to end at a certain time. But God seems silent. God, where are you? With all that's going on, I know I got a few witnesses that will testify to the truth. You had to ask God, where are you? And I can tell Some of you were hesitant to say amen right along through here because you were taught like me not to question God. We were taught, you don't question God. Before we were taught that, we were taught, don't question your parents. Don't question the elders, respect them. They tell you to do something, do it. No, I dare you to ask a question. (laughs) But this psalm teaches us that there's a difference in asking questions and questioning. There's a difference in asking questions and questioning. Asking implies you're seeking assurance. Yes, sir. Questioning implies you're making accusations. Yes, sir. Asking implies you're seeking assurance. Questioning <laughs> implies you're making accusations. When you ask God questions, you're saying, God, I know this is you, yes, but I need some assurance that you're in it. Yes, sir. God, I know that I'm in your will, but will you please show up? Okay, let me see if I can help you this way. Um, a lot of our bad theology in church comes from the songs we sing. Yes, sir. Amen. 
So the bad theology we have in church comes from the songs that we sing. And before uh, you turn your face up at me like that, I'm a musician. I love music. I love church music. I play the organ. I love church songs. But some of the worst theology we have comes through the singing ministry. And one of those songs that, that kind of piqued my curiosity as a child was that song that says, Except what God allows. Y'all heard that? And in that song, it says, don't question God, just accept what God allows. But there are times okay. when it's hard to just accept it. Yes, sir. I will continue that there are times that God is looking for you to ask some questions. That's right. Now look, brother. Yeah. God. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, uh, God wants us to follow, but he doesn't want us to follow blindly. God is not a God that's going to lead you and lead you blind. I can ask God some questions without blaming God. Yes, sir. Okay, y'all don't believe me. Let me see if I can help you this way. Jesus is hanging on the cross. Yes, sir. Suffering excruciating pain at the hands of the Roman Empire, being led by the hand of God. And in his final moments, he cries out, My God, my God. Yes, Why? Hast thou forsaken me? Yes, Jesus, the Son of God, who was all God and all man at the same time. Jesus, who had healed the sick and raised the dead. Jesus, who had fed 5,000 with two fish and five little biscuits. This same Jesus, the Son of God, even in this moment, felt like he was abandoned by God. Yes, he felt like God was absent, felt like God had literally left him hanging. But Jesus lets us know that even when you don't think God is there, he's there. How did Jesus do it? Because after saying he felt forsaken, before he gives up the ghost, he says, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You missed it. Jesus felt like he was forsaken, but he had said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Jesus shows us that even when you can't sense him, you can trust that he's there. Even when you can't see his hand at work, you ought to leave your worries in his hand. I wonder if I got some witnesses this morning that can testify. You've been there where you've been looking around and you can't see God, you can't feel God, you can't touch God, but you know that somewhere God is there. You just cried out, God into your hands, I put it on. Uh, I, I told you I don't preach long, so I'm just about done. So preacher, you've talked about these desperate afflictions. Yes. You've talked about this despondent appeal. Psalmist doesn't understand what he's going through. He's feeling like he's dead, living, feeling like no one cares, and even feels like God has done it to him on purpose. Yes. Then he asks these questions, asking God, God, are you here? Yes. God, do you see me? Yes. But there are some dormant answers wow. in this song. Wow. Some dormant answers. The psalmist is suffering desperate affliction, asking some despondent questions, but there is some hope. Verses 3 through 18, we get a list of afflictions. Yeah, yeah. We get a list of questions. Yeah. The psalm ends in a very dark and depressing place. It ends by saying, Darkness is my only friend. But in all of that, there's still hope. And the hope is found in the two verses I read. Yes, sir. In the verses before the sermon started, there was some hope. Before the afflictions, before the questions, yes, there's hope. Okay, where's the hope, preacher? I'm glad you asked. The psalm opens with, O oh Lord, God of my salvation. Yes, sir. I missed it the first time, too. The psalm opens with, O oh Lord, God of my salvation. The psalmist says before anything else, yes, sir. the Lord will be his salvation. Yes, sir. Before I get to these afflictions, before I get to these questions, the Lord will be his salvation. Yes, sir. Okay, maybe that's a little too simple and plain for some of y'all. So let me say it this way. Um, I recently graduated uh, from seminary with a Master of Divinity degree. And uh, it was a rough journey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
some of the professors were tough. Uh, seemed like they didn't want you to make it. They didn't want you to pass. You would think that at the seminary where we were talking about God, they would show some grace and mercy. <laughs> but that was not always the case. The classes were challenging. There were a lot of sleepless nights. A lot of tough assignments. Some papers I still have nightmares about. But there was one experience that I will never forget. That I was struggling with this assignment and I, I can admit that I can sometimes be a proud fellow. And I don't want to ask for help. I can figure it out. I'm pretty smart. I know what I'm doing. But this assignment got the best of me. Oh, man. And it was the day before that assignment was due. I know I'm a procrastinator. Don't judge me. <laughs> so I reached out to some of my smarter friends that had already finished their degrees. They couldn't help me. So, I went back to the syllabus. You know the syllabus that they give you yes, before the class starts in. I went back to try to read through the directions for the assignment. But the problem is, I couldn't find all of the syllabus. Uh, I had printed it out, but all I could find was the first page. Uh, mm. I see you right. All I could find was the first page of the syllabus. And on this first page, all that was on there were the learning goals and outcomes of this course. So what you're going to learn, what you're supposed to be able to do with what you learned in here, yeah, yeah, yeah. that didn't help me at all. So I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, how am I going to turn in this assignment? If I miss this assignment, I might fail this class and got to pay some more money. I don't want to do that. Right, right. So I'm sitting there with this syllabus in my hand, reading through it, and something told me, must have been the Holy Ghost, told me, just look at the top of the syllabus. At the top of the syllabus, was the professor's contact information. At the top of this syllabus was the professor's oh. contact information. I didn't have the explanation for the assignment. I didn't have any aid to help me. But what I did have was the contact information of the one who gave the assignment. So I picked up my phone, dialed the number, the professor answered the phone. I explained to him my dilemma. This is what he said to me. Fielder, I'm glad you called. Send me what you have, and I'll look at it while we're on the phone. I emailed that professor what I had. We waited. We talked through the assignment. And when he got it, he started laughing. I'm upset. What's so funny? That man said to me, Fielder, this looks good. In fact, it's already completed. Yes, sir. Don't change the thing. I've got it from you. My time is up. Thank you for your time. May the Lord bless you real good. But before I take my seat, I need to remind somebody that when you don't understand, when you have questions, just refer to the top of the syllabus. You've got the answer before you get to the assignment. I want somebody to testify this morning that there have been times in your life you forgot about the God that saved you. You forgot about the God that made the way before and he can do it again. Matter of fact, if you look at our syllabus, which happens to be the Bible, the very first line in it says, in the beginning, yeah. God. So before the beginning, beginning, God was and God is and God will be. The songwriter put it this way, Jesus is the answer. For the world that they above him, there is no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus, the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. That means that before you had a problem, God had already worked it out. How did he work it out? He sent his son Jesus to 42 generations to die one Friday on the cross for your sins. But that's not how the story is right early. Sunday morning, God got him up with all power in his hand. Power to make you walk right. Power to make you talk right.
my left side that has confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and received your name. Everybody that on my left side, on my left side, that has confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What about down in the center? Down in the center. What about on my right side? On my right side. And perhaps you may be watching by way of virtual and you had to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. All you have to do is type in the comment section, I want to be saved. And somebody, the Holy Spirit would have a way of signing your name. July the 13th through the 15th at Paradise Baptist Church. Tuesday through Thursday, there will be Christian education seminars virtually each night, starting at five minutes after six to seven o'clock p.m. The teaching topics, the now, the next, and the new normal. The seminars will follow by the auxiliary director's message. Tuesday, July the 13th, the now will be presented. 7 o'clock p.m. Layman Auxiliary Hour. Wednesday, July the 14th, the next will be presented. 7 o'clock, Ursha's Director's Hour. Thursday, July the 15th, the new normal will be presented. 7 o'clock p.m., the Young Adults Night. 
There is no registration fee to participate. Auxiliary Week is both virtual and in person at Paradise Baptist Church. Zoom uh, meeting ID and passcode and dial in information will be posted on the bulletin board for those who are interested. Louisiana Missionary Baptist State Convention, Congress of Christian Education Annual Session starts July the 21st through the 23rd from 6 o'clock to 8.30 p.m. Registration deadline is July the 15th. Virtual classes are, first class is 1012, Survey of Exodus, class 2097, Rethinking Christian Education, class 4012, Doctoring of the Holy Spirit, class 5022, Conflict Resolution, class 6013, Organizing the Church for Christian Education, seminar one, the Greek Journey and Seminar 2 is grant writing. If you're interested in taking any of these classes, please see Ms. Alberta Davis or you can <coughs> contact me at the church phone number, which is 318-221-3178. Blessed are those who mourn. Reverend Ernest Holloway, the beloved father of our pastor, was laid to rest this past Friday. We all experience death in our life. And we know we get our strength from the Lord, but we also need each other in these seasons. Yes, please. please continue to pray for Pastor Sister Pritchett, his mother, Sister Patty Holloway, and the family. Yes. Thank you, and God bless. Amen. Amen. Thank God again uh, for your pastor extending the invitation. I pray um, that he doesn't regret that invitation. I pray that something was said uh, to help you on your Christian journey this week. Uh, I want to say to you that um, if you don't have anything else to do next Sunday, do not miss next Sunday. You're going to get some real preaching next Sunday when this pastor stands uh, to deliver God's word. Again, uh, thank you again for your hospitality. Thank you again for your attention. Uh, if there's nothing else, let us go. Forgive me, uh, Pastor O.J. Made, made it clear to me to let you know.